Hello, my name is Char Char Charles Schwarz. I am a sophomore from Beacon Falls, Connecticut, studying physics and material science. But that's not what my project was on. I studied um, emotional reactions to robots this summer, summer with my mentor, Professor Nowak, in the Human Computer Interaction Lab. So the robots are coming. Uh, we've heard for like a long time that like the robots are going to take all of our jobs. There won't be anything left for us to do. And that hasn't quite happened yet. But it is true that robots are becoming increasingly common in our everyday lives. If you've been in Stop and Shop recently, you might have seen this guy right here who walks around the aisles and looks for spills. Um, this is an article I saw about a robot that's being used in chemistry labs to help scientists work from home and actually social distance during the pandemic. And this is a robot seal that's used for therapy in nursing homes in Japan, actually. And these are just a few applications, obviously. Robots are in manufacturing, warfare, entertainment, all sorts of applications. And there's a lot of talk about like, how this will affect us politically and on an economic level. But the question I looked at is how will forming relationships with these robots affect us on a personal level and affect our behavior and emotions. So one of the central concepts in this sort of human-robot interaction research is called anthropomorphism. That's basically what it's called when we attribute human characteristics to uh, inanimate objects. And basically, we can think of anthropomorphism as a way that we understand the world around us. Um, when we don't understand the behavior of objects in our surroundings, we try to explain that as they're human. And we anthropomorphize all sorts of things. We can anthropomorphize animals, uh, the natural world, all sorts of machines. But robots are uniquely suited for anthropomorphism, of course, because they either do something that humans do or they sometimes look like humans. And typically when we talk about uh, anthropomorphism in human-robot interaction, we talk about the Uncanny Valley Hypothesis, which is a theory developed in 1970, actually, that talks about how the degree of human likeness of a robot doesn't increase linearly with its likability. Um, people generally like these sort of abstractly human robots, and they like really hu hu realistic robots over here. But as you see, like this guy right here, who's sort of not a perfect representation of a human, but almost there, those generally creep, creep people out, and they're called, that's what this is called, the Uncanny Valley. And um, this is just a graph of general like likability of robots. Uh, for my research, I wanted to hone in on like more specific, specific reactions people can have towards robots. So the two things I settled on were trust and empathy for robots. So trust is pretty straightforward. Um, it's just basically, would you rely on this robot to do a certain task? And it is very dependent on like, the task a robot is doing. Like you wouldn't trust the same robot to do your taxes that you would trust to do, like a, you assemble a car or like babysit your children. And then the other reaction is empathy, which uh, we also of course have like a sort of intuitive idea of what empathy is. It's our ability to like share feelings and understand the emotions of others. And um, it's kind of weird, like how can you have empathy for something that doesn't have emotions? How can you have empathy for a machine? But there is research, surprisingly, that uh, people can feel empathy for robots. This started with research on, about robot abuse. Um, you can see here that people get really distressed when, you, when people act violently towards robots. And this is actually a study that looked at the people's brain activity. And they found that the, watching a robot cut itself with a pair of scissors activated the same areas of the brain as watching people cut their hand, cut, cut their hand with scissors. It's somewhat interesting. And this 2009 study uh, investigated the relationship between robots' human likeness, so like whether they look like a human, and uh, the empathy people had for them. And they found a generally positive link, which is interesting because like, it shows that just because a machine looks like a human, we treat it like a human. So my original plan was actually just to replicate this study, but um, there were some methodological issues with how they did it. Like in each condition, the robots weren't doing the exact same thing. So I wanted to see whether I could uh, get similar results using different robots and more consistent situations between the different robots. So these are some hypotheses I used to sort of guide my research. Uh, 
First of all, just to show that we could manipulate how much people anthropomorphize robots, we uh, hypothesized that humanoid robots, which have like an arms and legs and a head, would be rated as more anthropomorphic. Um, my second and really main hypothesis was that the more people perceive a robot to be anthropomorphic and real, the more trust and empathy they will have for that robot. And lastly, uh, I also predicted that uh, when people trust, the, the robots that people trust most with social tasks will be slightly different than the robots people trust with non-social tasks. And this comes back to what I said earlier about trust being very dependent on what task a robot's doing. So the way we uh, tested the hypotheses was through two online surveys. Uh, I built these surveys in Qualtrics and distributed them over Amazon Mechanical Turk, which is sort of a crowdsourcing website. Um, so I included measures for how anthropomorphic and realistic people perceive the robots to be. And those were actually taken from studies of human avatar interaction, that's like, like online, that uh, my mentor does. And then I also adapted measures for trust and empathy from other studies on human-robot interaction. So we know that they don't just work in human situations, but also in robot situations. These are the images of robots I included in my first survey. People viewed two images, two of these images, and rated those robots on different scales. And um, after filtering out all the bad responses, we got back 144 responses to this first survey. So about 50 ratings per robot, because each person rated two. So results. Um, we did find that the humanoid robots over here were generally rated as more anthropomorphic than uh, non-anthropomorphic robots, like these ones on wheels. Uh, we tested this with a one-way ANOVA in SPSS statistics. We also looked at the interaction between a robot's task, appearance, and the trust people had for it. And we did find that uh, the task a robot was doing was very important in what, how much people trusted it. Uh, tasks like being in a factory or vacuuming a floor, people generally trusted a robot much more than uh, tasks like working in a nursing home or being a security guard, which of course makes sense. Like we might not want people's safety depending on machines so much. What we did not find was that there's an interaction between like the appearance and trust and the tasks people had for robots. People generally trusted these robots four and five the most for every single task. And lastly, uh, to look at the relationship between anthropomorphism and realism and trust and empathy, we conducted a series of multiple linear regressions. Um, we did find a significantly positive effect on trust and empathy ratings. You can see here, this is the chart, a scatter plot of anthropomorphism ratings versus empathy. And you see the generally positive trend, but it's also kind of all over the place. So it wasn't a great model. We were able to explain about 20% of the variance in uh, empathy ratings during this first survey. So to add on to our first survey, uh, to add on to our first survey, we also I uh, wanted to give people a better idea of like how these robots moved and what they looked like from different angles in the second survey. So instead of just including uh, static images of robots, we wanted to actually videotape them doing something. So these are uh, the robots I included in the second survey. They're mostly the same as the first survey. Uh, I didn't like design these robots. I ordered them and I assembled them and I programmed them so they would be able to navigate through a simple maze, as you can see over here. Uh, this is like an early prototype in my garage, and this is the final version. Can I play a video? So here's a quick video of what the final product looks like. So as you can see, it gives a close-up shot of the robot. You're able to see how the robot moves. You're able to watch it from different angles. You're watch it, able to watch it make decisions in the maze and get an idea of like it's its own autonomous uh, machine. That's the idea of it. These are all my assembled robots. And additionally, in the second survey, we also include an additional measure. 
We measured uh, people's animacy towards robots, which is how they attribute life to robots. Like when they perceive a robot as being lifelike, basically. So again, these are our other results. We had 146 responses this time using the same uh, distribution over Mechanical Turk. And we got mostly similar results to our first survey. We again saw that the humanoid robots were seen as more anthropomorphic and that uh, task had a very big effect on how much people trusted the robots. Um, in this survey, our model for empathy, which was based on both anthropomorphism and animacy, was much better. Um, we were able to explain about 56% of the variance in uh, empathy scores. Uh, you can see here, these are anthropomorphism versus empathy and anim animacy versus empathy. And there's a pretty visible positive trend between both. Um, and then we looked at trust, the, interaction, the regression between trust and our uh, perception variables. We saw that the only perception that really increased people's trust for robots was animacy but that anthropomorphism was also collinear with animacy. So basically how I interpreted this was that more anthropomorphic robots were seen as more uh, lifelike and more lifelike robots were perceived as more trustworthy. So that in that way, anthropomorphism has a sort of indirect effect on how much people trust robots. So what does this mean for actual robot design? So just to recap, uh, robot design impacts into the more for Robot design impacts how much robots are anthropomorphized, and anthropomorphized is linked to empathy and trust for robots. And this could be useful, in, of course, in a lot of different fields. Uh, of course, it's useful to have people trust their robots, and uh, empathy can also be useful if you want to elicit empathy to help people, to feel, so that people feel comfortable uh, helping robots and uh, forgiving robots when they make a mistake. But it doesn't mean, of course, that anthropomorphic design is a good idea for every robot. Um, once again, we have to come back to the uncanny valley. Most of the robots we included in this survey were relatively simple. They're all basically on the left side of the uncanny valley. But we would expect that like, if we had a super realistic robot walk through the maze, that maybe people would reject it if it came too creepy. And uh, probably even bigger thing is just the impracticality and cost of anthropomorphic robots. That's probably the biggest reason why you won't see something like this replacing the Roomba anytime soon. And even empathy itself can be impractical in some situations. Like um, in the military, if you have a robot that's going out and if it gets blown up by a bomb, we have to question whether we would really want uh, those military officials to have close emotional bonds with their robots. And there are also some pretty interesting ethical considerations for anthropomorphic robots. Um, in specific applications, like in the nursing home, like if we want to design an anthropomorphic robot to act as a companion for the elderly, uh, some people might say that's a good idea, but others have claimed that that's deceptive and infantilizing to uh, the patients. And there's even talk about like, if we have empathy for these robots and we care about them, then maybe we should have some legal protections for them, like we do for our pets. So uh, there are plenty of unanswered questions in this field. It's a very new field. Uh, our survey just looked at um, very static interaction between robots. It wasn't a two-way interaction because it was through a screen. Um, so it would be interesting to do more research with more dynamic interaction between robots, see how people feel when they can talk to robots and uh, actually touch them and have them respond. Um, it would be interesting to do more research on long-term relationships between humans and robots, which there is very little about right now. And obviously there's all sorts of different robot designs that we can apply this sort of research to, including zoomorphic robots, which look like animals, these sorts of hyper-realistic robots, which are almost distinguishable from humans, but they are now becoming possible, and all sorts of like weird robots like this crazy pneumatic actuator robot designed by NASA. So it's a very new field. There's a lot more questions to be answered. and. Um, it is, takes a lot of collaboration between social scientists and engineers to really understand how these relationships work and uh, how we can design robots that really help people in society. So very quickly, I just want to thank uh, 
my mentor, Professor Nowak, who guided me through all the social sciences part of this project, uh, Dr. Ma Dr. Moscudelli, who guided us through the pandemic, uh, my family, who allowed me to set up a giant maze in our basement, uh, all my classmates, the Holster Committee, the Honors Program, and of course, Mr. and Mrs. Holster. Uh, you all made this such a very deeply valuable experience, so thank you so much. See some sources. Thank you.